Hello everyone. Check out new channel Creepypasta Rules. We are close to 1k subscribes. Please do subscribe. For daily rules videos. R slash no sleep. Posted by you slash poltergeists. The man in my basement takes one step closer every week. Part 8. Throughout all this, I kept thinking about my childhood friend Zach. They never found his body. The only thing they found was a green bicycle, mangled, twisted, and stained with blood and guts. Hit and run, according to police. Likely a semi-truck that didn't even know at first. Some driver, driving for miles, oblivious to the mess of gore stuck to the front of his truck. Driving all the way to the next brake stop. It's more common than you'd think. The driver probably got spooked, cleaned the gore off his truck, lied to himself, and said it was just a deer or something, and that's that. I never bought it. Back when I still cared, I was convinced something else was at play, something incomprehensibly terrible. It took me over 10 years to finally accept the given explanation. That was the first step to moving on, I finally stopped thinking about Zach every day. Sometimes, I didn't think about him for weeks, even months. Up until the intruders mocking theatrics, I'd barely thought about Zach for years, and that was fine by me. Anything to get a good night's sleep. But now, memories of Zach played through my head like half-remembered dreams. Like the time he jumped from a second-story bedroom window onto his trampoline, and his mom screamed at us from the living room. The time we stayed up all night playing Super Mario Bros. when my dog died, and Zach came over, and didn't say anything, didn't try to make me feel better, he just sat with me, and that's all I needed. I didn't have a real friend before Zach, and I haven't had one since. I agreed to meet with Paul in a public park. My plan was simple, let him do all the talking, hopefully learn something along the way. At this point, it didn't make much sense to confront Paul on anything. I'd only bring up the coat track if needed. I still didn't even know if Paul was Paul. But that didn't matter right now. Gray skies above. Paul sat on a park bench overlooking a duck-filled pond. Reddish-orange autumn leaves carpeted over muddy grass. I approached from behind, Paul. He looked back over his shoulder, breathing fog. Let's go for a walk. We trudged down the gravel path, boots crunching against the gravel. You know I struggled with booze, right? Said Paul. I nodded. I told you the first time I saw the intruder was in the basement, yeah? Well that wasn't entirely accurate. I did see him once before that. Way back in 81. Holly and I, not married yet, we're camping, out in Utah. Los Al Mountains. He stopped talking and looked around as if to make sure nobody else was too close. Satisfied, he looked straight ahead as we moved down the path, so there was this area, he continued, not far from the main campsite. Bunch of caves. Not caves like tunnels or whatever you think. More like a pile of giant boulders overgrown with trees and moss and tiny spaces between the boulders. Crevices, some of them big enough to crawl through. Yellow signs up, don't enter the Paul suddenly stopped talking. Up ahead, on the gravel path, a tall man with a scarf wrapped around his lower face strode toward us. He was heading straight for Paul. His boots crunching against the gravel, faster and faster until he strode right past us, as if we weren't even there. Paul looked back over his shoulder, waiting for a safe distance before continuing, so we're out by these caves, and I was drinking, more than I should have been, and Holly, we're jumping from boulder to boulder, having fun while I know? But... Some of those rocks must have been over 40 feet tall. So we reached this one crevice, a bit wider than the rest. A sheer drop, about 30 feet down, getting thinner and thinner right up to a slit of darkness below. Holly jumps at first, no problem. I jump at next hand, my foot slips. He stopped walking for a moment, thinking back, remembering. Part of me wanted to cut him off, burst into accusations, but another part just wanted to know what happened. He trudged onward, so I tumbled over backward head first into this crevice. My skull slams against the wall, and I black out. Come to about, 20 maybe 30 seconds later and, I can barely breathe. My body's wedged between the boulders, my chest squeezed down on either side. My neck twisted and viced between the walls. I was stuck. Upside down and looking straight into the darkness below. He stopped walking again, and his eyes drifted towards a nearby bench, you mind if I sit? I didn't respond. Paul strolled over and slumped down onto the bench, staring out over the pond, his cold blue eyes snapping back and forth over the water. I squatted down on the path in front of him, resting my elbows on my knees. A shimmering breeze crept over the pond and a wet leaf stuck to the back of my head. I pulled it out, and tossed it back into the wind. So I'm stuck, 
said Paul, upside down, head first, wedged between these two giant boulders. Blood rushing, ears ringing out. Gasping in little sips of air as my vision blurs in and out. Holly's above, screaming down, asking if I'm okay, but I can't answer. I try speaking, but only muffled whimpers escaped. You ever had a nightmare where you scream for help, and your voice falls back into your throat? Again, I didn't respond. So Holly, Paul continued, she can see my feet twitching down there, so she knows I'm still alive and, she yells down, she's gonna get help. Tells me to try and stay awake. This was pre-cell phones, mind you. Though I doubt there'd have been service out there anyway. He sniffed a little, and wiped his nose with the back of his sleeve. So now, he said, I'm stuck out here, completely alone. Sun's still out, but it's getting dark. I'm in the shadows anyway. I can't really describe the terror of it, being stuck like that. Maybe you could imagine it's like being, stuck between two giant boulders head first upside down. He looked at me, expecting a laugh, I breathed out my nose. He looked away. So I'm there, doing everything I can to stay calm. Keep saying why no? Trying to focus on what little breath I had. Making notes of my surroundings, green moss, grey rocks, shadowy crevice. He paused again, then looked directly at me, and that's when I saw him. Or at least the faintest outline of him. My eyes were still adjusting but, down below, about ten feet away. Something was there. He went silent, his pupils dilated, as if he was back in the dark. I thought it was a giant spider at first. He looked away, embarrassed, stupid. I know. He wiped his nose with the side of his hand. Then I thought it was like rocks maybe, optical illusion, why no? All I could see was the faint shape of a body, and the glint of what might be eyes, so maybe it was nothing. But as my vision adjusted, the whole picture came slowly into view. Still dark, still covered in shadow, but unmistakable. A man was down there, his body contorted and twisted, wedged between the rock like a trapdoor spider. Motionless. So fucking still. Almost stiller than the stone. Like a circus contortionist hid down there, waiting for me. Paul shook his head like a chill went down his spine, his face filled with absolute nothing. Cold eyes. Dead eyes. Like shark eyes, again. Paul looked straight at me. Maybe it's a body? I thought, trying to make sense of it. Maybe somebody fell down here before me? But then. Paul cleared his throat, his face was changing, changing so slow it was almost invisible. Like the sun moving, you can't see it actually move, but next thing you know, it's over there. His blank face, shifting to a portrait of pure terror. Like he was mirroring my inner emotion. My heart beat faster, thumping against the rock with every pump. My vision fading as all the blood in my body drained downward until. I was about to pass out. I welcomed it. But then I heard him speak. Paul grimaced regretfully. Well, maybe heard's not the right word, he didn't open his mouth, and I didn't really hear anything. But I felt it. Like something getting carved into my spine this is all me being stuck between these two rocks barely breathing this is was all everything ever was and ever would be everything else my life with holly fishing on a summer weekend biking down the number seven it's all nothing but a thin sheet that can and will be ripped away at any second paul shifted his weight i can't explain why but that unspoken message was so clear like my entire life had been a dream and i just woken up there wasn't a shred of doubt in my mind said Paul, of course, that didn't make me feel any better. He chuckled bitterly, my panic shot into levels I didn't even think possible, the intruder's face changing to match. My vision getting dimmer and dimmer as more and more blood pushed into my head until, finally, I blacked out again. He paused, again looking around as if to make sure nobody else was within earshot. I woke up in an ambulance, hysterical. Screaming and wailing about the man tucked between the rocks like a spider. Holly and the paramedics doing everything they could to calm me down, keep me from hurting myself. Finally, they ended up sedating me, and I dozed off until the hospital. He wiped his mouth, concussion, minor cuts and bruises. He chuckled, all that for that. Doctor told me it's common for concussed people to hallucinate, especially considering the lack of oxygen and me being upside down. Doctor told me about a fellow who almost drowned once, thought he saw the Easter Bunny in the water. I've always been scientifically minded and that made sense to me. Brains play weird tricks. Hallucination made more sense than some circus contortionist sneaking down there just to fuck with me. Paul sighed, leaned forward, and rested his elbows on his knees. He looked at me as if that was all he had left to say. I was about to speak when. I'm guessing you found the tunnel, 
Huh? Said Paul, nonchalantly. I didn't respond, I didn't know how. Paul nodded, pushed up from the bench, and walked down the path. I followed. Yeah, I meant to tell you about that. Said Paul, smiling grimly, so, after I tried shooting the intruder, all those years back, he rubbed the knuckle stub where his pinky finger used to be, things got bad, really bad. The fucker started taking steps forward every other day, sometimes every single day. Tried a lot of things to slow him down, but the only things that worked, the maze and the bunker door. Had some friends from the army help me with that. He shook his head, I was a medic in the war. Did I ever tell you that? Again, I didn't respond. I was doing everything in my power to stay calm. Of course, Holly and I were already on thin ice, and then I shot my own finger off. He smirked, building an apocalypse maze bunker was the cherry on top. She took the kids and left. Which, honestly, was fine by me. I didn't want my family around the intruder anyways. Or around me, for that matter. I was still painfully aware of the fact that I might just be completely insane. He stopped walking for a moment, looking around again. He continued, but her leaving. That really kicked me into gear. I forced myself to stop drinking. I started getting help. Professional help. Started taking meds, the right meds. And sure enough, things actually got better. The bunker door seemed to be keeping the intruder at bay. Sure, he was loud as hell banging on it every night, but I wore earplugs, blasted white noise, and, that was good enough. In a weird way, I was almost at peace with his being there. Paul sighed, breathing out fog as we walked along the path. So anyway, one night, maybe six, seven months after Holly left. I wake up, and it's quiet. Dead quiet. No banging on the door, no screaming and howling from the basement. Just nothing. That silence filled me with a fear worse than anything I'd felt before, getting stuck between those boulders included. It terrified me for a few reasons, first, it made me wonder what he was up to. Second, I'd gotten so used to the sound, I couldn't even sleep without it. In a twisted way, the intruder had given me a purpose, something to reckon with. And now he was gone. Paul looked up at the grey autumn skies, squinting as diffuse sunlight cast against his face. So a few weeks of nothing go by and then, on a Sunday afternoon, Holly calls me up out of nowhere. I guess she heard through the grapevine that I was doing better, getting help, why no? She asked me how I was doing, asked me if I wanted to get coffee, maybe see a movie. Can you believe that? Just like how we met. She asked me out. Back in those days? Smiling, Paul shook his head, I said that it'd be nice, said next Tuesday'd be alright. Paul went silent as if considering his next words carefully, then I set the phone down, and turned around, and there, set in the middle of the living room floor, a bottle of cognac. He scoffed, unopened. Paul rubbed his forehead with the back of his thumb, I was sober for over half a year at this point, but I drank the whole thing. He glanced over at me, catching the judgment in my eyes. He looked back down the path, I drank it cause it was there, said Paul. And then I get the brilliant idea to go check on the intruder. You know, just see what he'd been up to. I'd only ever tried to kill him once, and that backfired. Paul chuckled, but my shit-faced brain got some ideas in it and I, drunk as hell, staggered downstairs, lurched open the bunker door, and tumbled inside. But there's nothing down there. No stack of boxes. No circus contortionist. Nothing. So I stagger further, down through the maze all the way to the back corner, and there it is. A tunnel, dug into the basement floor, barely big enough to crawl through. Now, I assumed he was setting to wrap back around into my house, so I lost my mind. I scrambled back upstairs, planning to come back down with the 9 mil again and try god knows what. Paul started walking faster now. And then I go upstairs and. There he is. Standing in the dead center of the living room, right where the bottle of cognac was. Covering his face with his hands, like a kid trying to hide, and that's when I finally fucking noticed it. On his left hand, the fifth finger was cut off short at the first knuckle. Paul held up his own hand, everything suddenly clicked, he snapped his fingers with surprising loudness. I didn't know why, and I still don't know why, but he's connected to me, and in my head, the only way to stop it was to. He trailed off into somber silence. Still drunk as fuck and not thinking straight. I get into my old pickup truck, and peel off down the hill, up the number 7, and I just drive. I drove past old house, up through merchant, and kept going. I knew exactly where I was headed. Pedal to the floor the whole way there, finally feeling like everything made sense. 
Like every single little thing in my entire life was building towards this. You know? I didn't respond. So I keep driving, faster and faster up towards the Balry Cliffs, whipping round every corner like a high-speed chase until, I screeched to a stop, nearly slammed my face against the steering wheel. High beams cast over a long stretch of empty road, everything pointing towards the Balry Point lookout. He stopped walking and stared straight ahead, as if he was back in the truck, looking down a long stretch of road. I shifted back into gear, slammed my foot into the pedal, and the tires spun out against the pavement a few seconds before they caught, and the truck lurched forward, hauling faster now. Straight towards the cliff's edge. City lights below casting up into the night above. I shut my eyes. Any second now I'd be sailing through the air and... Again, he snapped his fingers, everything crumpled into a crashing stop. My head snapped forward and smothered into latex airbag. The stench of plastic and booze and gasoline. He paused for a moment, eyes flicking back and forth across the path ahead. Turns out the city installed stopping posts on the cliff edge, said Paul, front bumper falling off, I drove all the way back home. It was bright out by the time I got there. The intruder was gone. Paul started walking again, I latched up the bunker door and didn't go back down for years. The whole time expecting any day now. He'd come pushing up through the floor, but it never happened. Paul shrugged, look, I know it's a lot of talking, but all this to say, I can help you pass this off to somebody else. I shook my head, tired of the games, tired of the workarounds, the same way you pass this off to me? I mean, it wasn't intentional, but yes. More or less. Look, you don't need to decide right away. How far along is he? Top of the stairs. But still in the basement? Yes. Do you have a guest over? Yes. You barricaded the door? Yes. Good, take some time to think about it. Even if he gets out of the basement, there are other ways to pass him off. Also, don't be freaked out if you see him upstairs. Even with the door barricaded, he can do that. But he'll always set back to where he left off. All of his rambling still didn't explain his inexplicable knowledge of the coat track. I almost brought it up, but stopped short. Maybe Mitch was right. Maybe the intruder really did get to Paul?